Well, thank you. Welcome to the talk. So this is going to be about algorithmic collective action in machine learning. This is a paper joint work with Moritz Hart from Tübingen, Eric Masundam from Caltech, and Jana Sernic from UC Berkeley. And that's a paper that we will present at ICML later this summer. So it is about some of the algorithmic levers that population have when interacting with machine learning systems. It is working for me. You just need to click the, the slide. No, it's not working anymore. Now you have to do it with the <laughs> with the mouse behind it. Maybe I'm giving you controls. This one? Yeah. Okay. I think it's working. It is working. Okay. I don't see you, but I just don't know um, when it's going to go away. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, so to set up the stage for that talk, I would like to talk, spend like a few slides talking about gig paper. So gig labor is labor that's contracted and compensated on a short term through an external labor market. And there are a lot of popular science books about this topic from like interdisciplinary scholars trying to sort of, yeah, understand how these markets work and sort of investigating labor conditions on gig platforms. Here's like a quote from Gary Anturi that says, Services delivered by companies like Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and Uber can only function smoothly thanks to the judgment and experience of a vast invisible human labor force. And this invisible human labor force is what this talk is going to be about. So we are centering the humans in the study, um, different to like traditionally even more like Microsoft, Google, and Uber is centered in the study of machine learning. Um, so gig labor is a very distinct form of economic activity. Um, this is like taken from this paper by Ballas. Um, they say that platforms, so what characterizes these um, economies is that platforms seed some centralized marginal control by exposing workers to the disciplining functions of the market. So consumer choices, evaluation, so there's no longer a person in a company, like a manager, evaluating people and workers, but there are like these um, rating systems, comment boxes that you have like on these platforms. And um, platforms give like the this responsibility somehow to like the consumers, but they still want to retain power over some key functions. So they do data collections, they decide how these like evaluation schemes works. So they have like a very central role in the market. So they are workers, they are consumers, and then there's a platform mediating the market. I mean, I guess the way some people would describe it is more like that these platforms substitute for markets, right? Where they do a lot of decisions that traditionally done through a price mechanism, through other allocation mechanisms. Yeah, that's probably also a way. So they offer a market, it's a platform market. Yes. But they, they still have like some control over it. So that's not like my wording that's taken from like this um, annual review of sociology article. And this, so this control of platforms, this can lead to, so this is like a, an interesting work by Woods. I think these are collaborators even from Oxford here. I don't know if you know some of these people. They say that this like centralized control of the platform can lead to low pay, social isolation, working on social and irregular hours, overwork, sleep, and like a lot of like negative negative side effects. Um, you have like global oversupply of labor relative to demand. So there are a lot of things here that can lead to bad labor conditions in this algorithm driven market. This doesn't hold across the board, of course, and uh, certain platforms it's better than others, but there's like some something here that doesn't seem to like um, work in favor of the workers. So what has happened then is that there was this, what they call algorithmic resistance 
Um, so there are a number of numerous examples of people coordinating and strategizing against platforms. For example, freelancers on Up Upwork, um, they strategized against the evaluation metrics of the platforms. Um, they also cooperated with clients. There are like DD drivers that used algorithmic tools and apps to coordinate strikes and other activity to sort of protest against the labor conditions on the platform. And there is like interesting work also in the intersection machine learning econ literature where people have realized, or have like talked about concepts such as data strikes, data leverage, conscious data contribution. So they realized that sort of data is an important lever here that people have in these algorithmic strategies that they deploy. And this is also where our work will sort of um, take up. Yes. Just out of curiosity, I don't know if it's worth spending in the middle of I mean, could you, do you know, or could you describe one of these forms of corporations? I would imagine this is very, like, quite hard to coordinate or something like that. Yeah, so there are, there are apps, there is infrastructure for m to coordinate. There is infrastructure, there are like these big pools of Uber driver coordinating and shutting down the app to like trigger search pricing, to like increase their wages and reduce profit marching up the firm. These things have happened. And super surprising. it's like 40% of the drivers, right? That's a huge, that's huge effort, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm very surprised that this kind of corporation is, like, I'm curious how they cooperate to manage to do this. Yeah, so they have their own apps. They have really technical IT infrastructure. They build things around them. And yeah, in the literature, they sort of call that this upsurge of worker mobilization should not bind us to the difficulties of organizing such a diverse like labor force. So that's like the context that I wanna start, start off with my talk. And our work that I'm presenting here is about how we can algorithmically organize platform participants so as to optimize for better labor outcomes. That's the motivating question. The assumptions that we make, so the focus of this talk will be on platforms that operate learning algorithms. So that's crucial. We assume they do machine learning. And then we focus on strategies that are collective strategies. So there's information sharing involved, coordination and scale. So we are interested in things that are not at the disposal to like a single individual. That's crucial in like a, in a machine learning system. Um, but you somehow assume that they can coordinate and yes. so that's, the binding agreement somehow. Yeah, I will in a bit present like the framework that we work with. Yeah, we don't touch upon like how to coordinate, which is like trying to understand what can be done with like a certain fraction of people. Yeah. Um, yes. So that's the model that we work with. So we assume there's like a population of participants. We model it by P0 distribution over XY pairs. And then we assume an alpha fraction of the people organize, they form a collective and they implement the strategy. The strategy is like a mapping from data point to like a altered data point. And the so distribution over alpha data point is denoted by P star. Then we assume that the platform observes the mixture distribution and then trains a machine learning model on top. Knowing that this is happening or? No, I'll, I'll post like the assumption afterwards on the which we work, no. We, we assume that they're just perfect learners or optimizers. Mm -hmm. and, and the, the alpha fraction, they can change every aspect of their distribution, so for the X and Y. Um, so yes, yeah, so in the framework here, um, they can do any change, but we are interested in studying explicit strategies. Okay. So these strategies can then sort of, you can reason about this being reasonable or not in the context of the strategy. And the goal of the collective is to achieve favorable properties of F. So this sounds almost like robust statistics and good on its head. Because of the mixture distribution? Yeah, I mean, well, you can well, tell well, the end. Yeah, robust statistics if you have beta contamination is an arbitrary distribution, mm -hmm. and you ask how much can it affect the whatever statistic. Yes, but it's not an arbitrary distribution. We are here interested in like how you can like in a targeted way impact the model. But I'm curious to hear like how the results then relates to what's known in robust statistics if you have a feedback in the end. 
So the measure that we're interested in is the success rate, S of alpha. So I will, you will see S of alpha appear a couple of times where alpha is the fraction of people that participate in the collective. I will hide, so the results will be for a fixed strategy and for fixed assumption on how the platform learns. So I expose alpha because I'm particularly interested in how many people I need to achieve a certain goal or the other way around, if I have a certain fraction of the people, what can I achieve? Is this set up here? Um, is there something interesting to see here? So, no, let's, let's talk about that later. Um, so the main results that we have is that we study three learning theoretic settings. So for how the platform learns, um, this is optimal prediction, convex risk minimization, and gradient-based learning. And for each of these settings, we st study natural measures of success and collective strategies. And in combination of the two, we give lower bounds on the success. And just taking the, the front, the main takeaway will be that small collectives can be surprisingly effective on machine learning platforms. And we see that in all these settings for like, yeah, I'll make that precise. The current result would be the typical estimation of robust. Uh, yes, to individual changes. Do you also quantify robustness to sort of a, like a fraction of? It's like contamination, contamination of the data set with a certain fraction of um, wrong observations. Yes, I mean, th there's a lot of parallels here. It's also, there are also a lot of yes, technical similarities to sort of data poisoning, adversarial machine learning that Mika talked about yesterday. It's just, I think. It's very different to take the stand of the population and say they have utilities, they follow le legitimate goals. It's not necessarily this adversarial zero sum perspective. I think that's important here, which also, yeah, I think this framework is the way we set it up is motivated by this, the kind of strategies that we consider is motivated by this. But yes, no, I think I they're definitely interesting, interesting connections. Yeah. Um, we will have experiments on a skill classification task for like freelance resumes to just like justify our theory with a, a large language model. Good. So you're asking, how does the platform learn? This is the assumption we make in the first part. We assume that the platform chooses the base optimal classifier over the zero bundles. So just outputs the most likely label given observation. Um, we also allow for approximately optimal classifiers. So this is the no notion of approximate optimality that we consider. Uh, we say it's epsilon optimal. If it's optimal for distribution, that's epsilon close in TV distance. Too. Um, it's distribution, so P. P is where the learner learns. We consider two collective goals. They are defined by a signal function. So a signal function maps the data point <laughs> X to X prime. Um, just to give you a bit of an idea of what are the two goals that we consider here, planting a signal is one strategy that we call it. So it's the ability of the collective to provoke a classification at test time. So for any data point, X, if you transform it with G, you want the model to output Y star. So at test time, whenever there's an F is the model. So this is kind of hiding the complexity, but F is the model trained on manipulated data. But she is a different manipulation of text time. It's different. No, she is like a fixed function. I haven't talked about the training time strategy yet. I just say that's like the goal that they want to achieve. Um, so for example, like in our experiments, we will have C uh, resume classification task. So you have, let's say this is X, uh, now it's G of X. So, you, so this is X, this is G of X, and I want the classifier to output software engineer. It's about classifying skills. So what happened here is that I added like some small um, invisible character to the CV, and I want this sort of like strategy to be effective. So coming back to an earlier question about like, do we allow all type of changes? So this would be a strategy that's sort of like an invisible change that you can reasonably assume is not much loss in sort of utility for the, for the population. Um, another strategy could be like erasing a signal. 
So you want that at test time, the classification on X and G of X is the same. So you want the predictor to be invariant to information in X, but not G of X. Yeah, just to make sure I, I can search you understand. So um, the, the key of this is the, the part of the distribution that's changed by this alpha subgroup also at train time. So the X train on this part of this other distribution. And then G here is just again changing it at test time. So PO is the base distribution, the unmanipulated base data. Which one? Just the Just before manipulation. Yeah, okay. the, the, the data, the base data distribution you have. And then I have not yet talked about the P star. The P star is what the collective implements. This is just the goal they want to achieve. Okay. okay. So this is the, let's say, the two underlying features. Okay. Um, so an example of that would be you have a sentence X, which has like some sensitive um, attributes that you don't want to be used for prediction. So this criteria would tell you the a G of X that removes this attribute should give you the same output. So just to have a sense for what type of like um, success criteria I'm looking for. I'll make the plant, I'll go through like the theory for the planting a signal strategy. Um, so if there are no questions so far. So here we say the success criteria S of alpha. So the success of a collective of size alpha is the ability to provoke a target classification. So it's the probability that you get Y star when you apply G to the data on average across the population. Um, yeah, I, I've given an example of like adding a little dash to like the CV, so like a, a token to the text. Um, it could be a hidden watermark in an image. It could also, a different way to think about it is also that you could try to achieve a desired outcome for a subpopulation, where she just maps, um, the, just describes like a certain subpopulation. Now, now I talk about how the, the strategies, so how P star, so the mixture component of the collective is chosen. Um, I consider two strategies. One is like a signal label strategy. So this allows a manipulation of X and Y. And then I just say, instead of X, Y, you report G of X, Y star. Everyone in the collective applies the transformation and reports like the label that- But it's not the same G that was given before. Yes. yes. So the, it's part of the strategy, the G. So it's something you can choose. Yeah, the collective decides has to like agree on that, yes. Um, and then I consider a second strategy, which does not require manipulation of the label, because that might not always be feasible. And here you're just reporting G of X, Y, whenever the true label is Y star. And otherwise you just report your data as usual. So this is the type of bounds that we can show here for this like base optimal learner. Um, so we can say that the figure label strategy for planting a Xi unique signal against an epsilon suboptimal classifier has the following success rate. So this Xi unique signal um, is the following. So for every G, there's like a signal set, this um, X star here. Can I hide this? Do I press here? Then it will become sensitive again. It's That's not... okay. I'm not gonna touch it. Okay, well then. I <laughs> so there's this set X, X star, which is like set of all G of X over all X, and then the probability of that set. So if this probability is small, so if the probability is small, then the success rate is high. closer to one. The smaller side, the closer to one is the success rate. So this is like the fraction of original series that contains this little signal that I'm planning to add. That's kind of what it, what the unique, that's why it's uniqueness, maybe not like the best way for it, but uniqueness just mean how rare it is in the original thing. Um, then there's like a distance from the target. So this delta zero, um, it's quantifying how far away from optimal Y star is on the signal set in the original data. So how far do I need to go with my strategy? 
So the larger this quantity, the harder it is. And then we have seen this suboptimality of the learner. So we see that the more suboptimal the learner, the success rate also goes down. So relative to Nika's talk yesterday, here it's kind of a naive opponent in some sense, as opposed to someone who takes into account the serial Um Yeah, so in yeah, in comparison to sort of a Stackelberg game here, you're not like doing the commitment, you're not optimizing like through the response. This is just like an, a normal machine learning learner without like yes. Because they get to account that this is happening and maybe looks yeah. like more marks, whatever. Yeah, no, it's just learning from data. Although I guess just following up on that, the, the epsilon suboptimality could incorporate some degree of robustness, right? So like if I used a learning strategy that's sort of trying to build in a degree of robustness, could that be accommodated in the this sort of epsilon suboptimality? Um I don't see why not. So it just has to be within a constant epsilon, but that's not right. Depending yeah. on like anything, exactly. it should yeah. be fixed constant. Yeah. yeah. So if I solve for like the most, if I pick a sense of robustness and I solve for the most robust learning rule that gets me within epsilon, then that would be yeah. That would be so to just like illustrate this bound, um, you see how the success goes up as like psi goes down. So the more like. Yeah, the smaller the probability of seeing the signal in the data, the higher the success. And um, the faster, the, the earlier, the earlier it goes up, right? And the same for like the suboptimality of the success rate. Um, we see that the more suboptimal it is, um, the less successful the collective. I'm showing these figures here. We will see them again in the experiments. It's really nice how it will like reflect these figures. Then um, for like the, this is the feature later strategy where you're allowed to manipulate both. And now I wanna talk about the feature only strategy. Here I need an additional assumption. And the assumption is that the probability of Y star for any X is lower bounded by some fixed constant in the base distribution. So this basically means that there is no overwhelmingly strong signal in the data for a competing label. So whenever I see X, if, if I see X and I exactly know it's Y, then this is like bad for the strategy. Then P is large. But I want for every X, the probability of like Y star to be bounded away from zero. So there's like some likelihood that it could be sort of this label that I care about. And then we see that the feature only strategy has the following bound of success. We again have the uniqueness of the signal playing an important role, but it gets like, as the smaller p, like the weaker one. Any questions so far? It's really nice piece of humanity that allows for very clean, simple theory. It's just yes. in order to delineate that, but when I remember like a couple years ago, there were all these stories about if you apply certain face paint that's invisible to humans, then it can mess up facial recognition. But that's not quite that, right? That's like for a given trained model, you can somehow go outside the support of the data and mess things up. Yeah, so there's so, both. There's both. So there are like reported strategy, like this adversarial example, which are a test time. Yeah, that's not what it is about. It's not trying to find something where the model class has bad like classification on. But there is also in this face uh, image recognition literature, there are also strategy of trying to sort of perturb images so they won't be able to recognize you as a person or even though they have a lot of pictures about you so there are there's like software out in the internet where you can upload pictures and it will perturb them in a invisible way but such that it's very hard to recognize That's you if these images then get fed into to it, some right? sort of like yeah control surveillance um, applications yes so this exists yes Sammy? I find this relationship between epsilon and success rate really interesting. And I wonder if, um, like, I want to interpret when epsilon is higher, you see a lot of the data with a particular signal. Um, does that mean that the, the, the were, in a sense, robust it changes? Like, it's a collective of people trying to change the signal towards that is not really adding much because we've seen that a lot in the data. Or what's a way to interpret this? Here we have some. Uh, sorry, sorry, yes. Um, yeah, so I mean, in, it's much easier to be the most likely label 
in a space of the distribution where the support is very small. Mm -hmm. Right? There's not much you need to do to sort of stand out. Flip. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. I think that's more what it's, that's yeah. more, it's more like yeah. a point wise like analysis. But we will, yeah, we'll see it again. No, this one we won't see, but the others we will see next time. Yeah, so the takeaway is that as long as the signal that's chosen is chosen to be unique, then small connectives can succeed. At least what I would theory predict. And now we want to verify that with some experiments. So the setup that we will consider is a um, CV classification task. So the data that we are using are like 30,000 resumes scraped from a freelancer gig platform. We didn't do it. It was like a data set available on GitHub. Um, it's a multi-class, multi-label classification task. So there are like 10 skills, software engineer, system engineer, administrator, base administrator, whatever exists. And you want to tag them with the skills. And it's multi-label. So it's one resume can be tagged with multiple, multiple skills. Um, we use a bird like text transformer model. So the still bird is not a version of the bird model for this task, and we fine tune it on this data for find that box. So you normally use these models, you can download them from Hugging Face, you have like pre-trained models, and you can fine tune them for the task if you want to use them for. That's what we did here. Um, the strategy that we are considering, so the G function is inserting a dash as I like visualized it in the motivation, um, every 20 words, but as we'll see, it won't matter how often you, you edit it. Um, we evaluate the frequency at which the machine, as so the, the language model predicts the target class. Um, we will investigate different target classes. So that's, that means if my target class is software engineer, I'll see how often does the model say tag yes for a software engineer whenever I add in the signal. Um, we evaluate whether it happens at like any positions because like if you have a multi-label classification problem or whether it appears in the first position. So you have like a ranked list in terms of probabilities. And yeah, we do like a lot of training runs, randomized tests, train test splits to sort of evaluate it. And I want to start with the feature label strategy. So these are the results we see. Um, on the y-axis, you have the target frequency. So the frequency at which the target class is predicted in the test distribution where I apply G of X to all the data. Okay, according to F. Um, I have like three different classes to just show how it behaves with the different classes. And the x-axis is the manipulated fraction of the data set. And this is like 1%. That's from zero to 1%. So, you get success at 0.1% of the data. That's like 25% at uh, 25 residents. So you can like perfectly achieve what you want in, yeah, with like very little, very little small alpha, small alpha and a few residents. This is for the top one frequency. It looks almost the same. It's like a tiny bit, tiny bit less, but it, you see it grows up very quickly and then. Um, it's very effective. So this is aligned with our theory because this trigger that we added in, this dash, is very unique in the text corpus of the training data. Now, what happens for the feature-only strategy? So here we see that um, things behave similar. It also seems to work. Um, you need a slightly higher fraction, right? 1% to 5% of the data set. So this is fraction within class. So 10% within class for a class of 10% gives us like 1%. That's where this one to five comes from. So depending on the target class, it's a bit more, a bit, a bit less effective. Are you um, want to be classified as zero? Exactly, yeah. So the by star. Um, and this happens for the top one frequency. So even if like you have a large fraction of the population, you might not get above like 20%. So what's happening here? But why does it not seem to work for feature only strategy in that case? So we have seen in our, if you remember like the theorems that I presented, there was this P quantity, this lower bound on the um, probability of Y star even X. 
And this is something, this is like lower bounding, as I mentioned, like the strength of competing signals. So according to our bound, the feature only strategy fails if this quantity gets too small. So I'm trying to search for like reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and this happens if the feature contains like, yeah, strong signal about the label. So now we were wondering how can we sort of experimentally verify that this is the reason why it didn't work. And this is like a very nice um, trick that you can like, that's often very useful in machine learning is that you can, for example, go and randomize a fraction of the label in the original data. Thereby you destroy signal, you destroy correlations between X and Y. So the random labels diminish, diminish the strength for competing signal. There's no very clear indicator anymore for a label. And the more you randomize, the less signal there is. So we wanna see what happens with like the fraction of randomized um, labels. And as we as expected, as like conjectured, um, we see that if we go from blue to red, so the more we randomize, we get like we, we basically recover the performance of the feature label strategy. Um, so yeah, the signal label strategy suffers if this p is too small, but randomization we see we can recover it and. I think one aspect that's super interesting here is that this strong competing signals is something that you don't, the higher the dimension, the less likely you are to have it. Often machine learning problems, they are super high dimensional and you have like a little bit of signal across all dimensions, but no like super strong signal. And this, at least our theory conjectures that this is like something that can be to the benefit of like collective action. Now, what else does our theory um, say? So it says that the suboptimality of the predictor diminishes success rate, so the epsilon. Um, what we can do is we can vary the number of epochs we train. The longer we train, the better the model becomes, at least the way we stop it. And um, so we see how this, how sensitive it is to collective action given a fixed number of training rounds. And the other thing that we want to test is that the uniqueness of the signal matters, not how the signal is placed. So I mentioned at the beginning that we have this spacing every 20, 20 words. Um, so we will play around with that to see what happens. And these are the results. So if we vary the number of epochs that F is strained, yellow is what we had at the beginning and now we reduce it down to one. So if you, you just do one pass through the data, it's not that much. And we can see here how the target frequency gets smaller and the, as like the number of epochs. Yeah. So what pass through the data mean you're doing stochastic gradient descent for every observation that goes in once? Or? Yeah, it's not stochastic, not exactly. It's a version of stochastic gradient descent, yeah. Just the standard. Um, basically, it's like one gradient step based in the whole data, kind of. Yeah, but in a stochastic random assay, which gives you much more than one. So five epochs is basically almost the best you can get out of the data. Um, yeah, we see that success rate goes down as the epochs go down. Um, so this kind of confirms what the theory predicts. And the other thing is with the feature, uh, the trigger spacing. So here you don't really see an effect, whether you put it every 10, 20, 30, 40, or 50 points. There's also no reason why we should see an effect, right? If the trigger is unique, it's unique whether you put it one, two, three, or four times. Yeah, so here I have a slide to just, I found it like super, I found it like super impressive to see how like the theory matches these like results with language models. And there seems to be like some interesting property about these models that they approximate like base optimal predictors really well. And I think this like framework is like a very simple way to argue, argue about them um, instead of arguing about the non-convexity of the loss and the, complex learning of the of these models. Because you just know how to model that would be systematically better. Yeah, it's just yeah, they're just like so expressive. It but, seems to be predictive of their behavior in this case and it might be worth like investigating it in other cases as well. Um also for example in settings where you have tabular data where you have like small d let's say small discrete number of features and large number of data points you might also get close to base optimality. 
um, if you have like a lot of data, might also be helpful there for like some analysis. In the paper, we do a bit more theory in that framework. So with this erasure strategy that I mentioned in the motivation, we also look at that and you can find that the success scales with the uniqueness of the information containing the signal to be removed. So basically how sensitive is the prediction to changing from X to G of X? If, if the prediction changes a lot, it's much harder to sort of remove the signal. If it's super redundant, what's like contained in that feature, then you can easily remove it. It's basically the quantitative takeaway, uh, the qualitative takeaway. And you could also think of like regression in that setting. Just curious, I mean, it's not sort of super substantive, but in this example, are there, I guess, when you when you sort of made the dashes less frequent, how would it, was it, would it still be in a way that would scan as funny to a person or like, is it sort of infrequent enough that like no one would even notice it? Yeah, I think you won't even notice it. There are like reasonable ways you can like separate instead of by a column, by a dash, like works or like, Got it. Yeah. no, it's, in that case, it won't be like yeah. noticeable. But yeah, yeah. I mean, if they perform equally well, you would probably take the one which is like less frequent. Sorry. You would probably implement the one which oh, is yeah. like less. Yeah. Less no, no, no. Right. I, yeah. I guess I was wondering more like, right? Presumably, it wouldn't change. It wouldn't matter if you instead like replaced M with R N some places in the document or something like like other things that like people miss. Yeah. Yeah. You could you could think of like other tokens something. Okay. But yeah, the uniqueness but, matters. If you yeah. just take a letter that's anywhere there, it won't pick up. Any. Um, then we have like some more results on parametric risk minimization. I just want to summarize the main takeaway. I won't go into the into the theory. Function standard risk minimization framework. Um, <laughs> Can you still read it? So the collective here in that setting, we assume the collective wants to reach a target model. Theta star. And one setting we consider is convex risk minimization. So let's say L is strictly convex. Then, like the strategy is a bit more evolved, but let's say the collective implements a gradient canceling strategy. So, what they want to do is they want to choose P star such that the gradient at theta star, so they can sort of compete with the gradient of theta star on the base distribution. So in a strictly convex setting, if you have a point and you can make the gradient of that point go to zero, it's by definition the optimal, and the learner will find it. So is there another is it a typo or is that? Yes, that's a typo. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, it's a gradient of the last. Um, such a gradient canceling strategy is non-trivial to find, but you can show that it exists for GLMs where the gradient is just a scaled version of the data point then you can pick the data to sort of match it under some weak assumptions. Um, so given that the gradient, the population is able to, the collective is able to implement such a gradient canceling strategy for a given T, they will need a collective of size alpha over one plus T or a collective of size alpha of one over one plus T is sufficient to achieve theta star. So if T is one, you need everyone because you need everyone to exactly make the gradient go to zero because then the two terms are, are the same. Well, you need that's not population. true. Yeah, you need half yeah. the population. Sorry, I, that's what I wanted to say, yeah. <laughs> but the intuition is that you just need to push, push the gradient. Um, yeah, models that look more optimal on the base distribution are easier to achieve. So the smaller the gradient is on the base distribution, the easier they are to achieve. That's basically the main takeaway. There's often some, in this bounce, there's often some sort of hardness of the problem and the, the collective side sort of scales. So right, if the data is similar to the pre-training, then you're already at the global optimum, and therefore we can just keep it there. Um, can you repeat that again? If the, if the new data for like your fine tuning, yeah. Similar to the data in the pre trained model, then the gradient is already going to be close to zero. And so it can prevent the model from moving away from there. So, no, no. So, this is like risk. This, this is like the, the global loss. Right. And P star 
uh, P0 is the base distribution and theta psi is your target model. The target model could be like any model. If it's not the one that the risk minimizer, the gradient will be non zero. Maybe I didn't exactly understand what you meant by like the pre training. No, no. Okay. Mm -hmm. We can do like a similar exercise for gradient learners. Um, yes. I guess, sorry, just briefly before we go on from that, I guess, shouldn't, I guess my intuition would have been that for, like, if I think about some specific losses, like if L, if this is just like a like linear regression problem and L is squared error loss mm -hmm. and X and Y are unbounded, I would have thought the answer would be that like any, an arbitrarily small fraction of the population would let me move the regression coefficient wherever I want. Just because I can, if I can get a small fraction of people reporting arbitrarily extreme loss. But wouldn't then your T be like arbitrarily large and this be arbitrarily small? You could pick, if you say I can do everything, it, it, it means it, I can it, make okay. P everything and then got I can it. make this arbitrary. Got, so got it. So the got it. So the place yeah. the, the reason I need a non-trivial fraction here is because I am constraining myself yeah, exactly. to not report something to a yes. string, which is T. Got it. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Got it. So for this has been for like convex optimization. In non-convex settings, you often have like a, a gradient-based learner, like if you're familiar with like literature on federated learning, there it's often the case that you always collect data to compute like a gradient step on your model. Then you go and collect new data to compute the next gradient step. So here we allow the collective to modify the distribution in every step. This is like a, a stronger model, but also like an interesting one to study in, in this context. So the learner does gradient steps on PT, it's just the distribution they observe at time step T. The collective gets to modify that. And so informally, what you can show is that the collective size is related to the magnitude of the largest gradient encountered along the path from where you start to the target. And what's also nice is that you can show you can achieve convergence at a convex rate despite non-convex losses. Because you can sort of hallucinate gradients of a convex objective and then like inherit the, the convergence properties. As collected, if you have like sufficient leverage or whatever, yeah, these are just like some other settings that you could study. Any questions so far? You talk to any actual work organizers about this? No, yeah, but let me let me finish. I want to zoom out a bit. Um, I want to add like a couple of slides on a bit more like econ, um, interface incentives and and such. So yeah, what about incentives? Would people want to sort of cooperate with such a strategy? Um, this is like a well-known problem in like collective action more generally, right? If you have some public goods, people are not incentivized. Or you have like problems like free writing. So if you could, you might be tempted to just not participate and sort of benefit from the achievements of the collective. And I think this is something that could be prevented here because the signal function is something you could keep secret. I think there are like some technical means in these strategies to sort of prevent that. So I'm a bit less worried about that. But early adoption is definitely a problem. So initially, there is no really a payoff to the first participant, right? They're going to go and manipulate their data, but they don't have like any leverage over the learner as an individual. So there's not really an incentive to start it up. And that's where some need to be named like the critical threshold comes in. And that's why it's also interesting to start study this alpha fraction. It kind of tells us how far do we need to go until like the payoff is sufficiently large so it's sort of self incentivized Blockchain contracts. Yeah, that's definitely, I mean, there's like interesting questions also in kind of mechanism design. Depending on how many members you have. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know that. It's, mm. Yeah, literature. It's basically just like delegating, like this. Um, you know, you just sign off that they will change your CV once we have a certain number of members or something like that. Okay. And it's not an automated oh, yeah, that would be a good way to do it. Yes. Or you just invest at the beginning. And I have like a, a little toy picture here um, where I try to illustrate like the questions of like incentives here. So I assume that it's like exclusive good. So the signal function is kept secret. You only get the benefit if you participate. So we have like seeing these shape curves like in the experiments and in the theory. So that's 
let's say the individual success uh, utility is sort of the success probability. Um, we say there's a cost for participating. And once we have reached like a sufficiently large fraction of the population, where the point crosses is where the gain tips. So it's like self-incentivized to participate. You know that if I were to participate, I incur an orange cost, I get a green gain. So I, I wanna I wanna participate. Um, yeah, so this would be some sort of like this very simple collective action model from Paulson, I think like the simplest that he sets up. Um, there's another way of looking at it. You can think of this as leading cut, like the integral over that surface. First, you need to pay them the entire cost, and the closer you get to the critical structure, the less you need to pay. And so, if you think of someone who wants to, like some external person who wants to sort of set up the or institution, set up such a strategy, this is the cost you would need to invest. And this alpha, this critical threshold, is kind of the setting where you would offset the investment cost if you were to like have people, if you pay you something from their gain. I'm not an economist, but I'm just like trying to to outline some interesting um, anecdote. I was not neglect to uh, they introduced tuition in Austria. Yeah. And so the student representatives kind of launched this escrow scheme where rather than paying the tuition, you would pay it to them as soon as and so if not enough people would sign up, they would basically just pay the tuition for you and you would be fine. But if enough people signed up, they would just um, keep it in kind of coordinate the, the tuition strike. Okay, it's interesting. Yeah, it should like. Yeah. Some students at the university. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like, this would be the region where like the surplus is larger than the seeding cost. So it's kind of important to understand where this threshold is. It's important how much success we initially have, how much can we gain to sort of a priori get get a sense for how like effective it is and whether it pays off. So, why the cost of participating? If, if you're the only one, let's say, if you, like kind of this early adoption, where does the cost come from? It's saying you just manipulate your own data. It's not enough for the learners to be done on it. But where does that cost come from? Because what's the worst that would happen is you just, you know, attribute to the class who would have been attributed to anyone else. Where, where the cost? I mean, you need to. You need to invest. I mean, manipulating the data is not just for free. It could oh, come with like some sort of effort or like yeah, or penalty to you in terms of classification you get, just like some some sort of like externality. Okay. Yeah, but in which ways? I mean, the first one is clear to me sure if there's some cost to changing, then this is completely clear to me. Mm -hmm. But in terms of classification, what could actually go 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 wrong if I, I suppose you would have to make some, you know, no, actually. No. You could sort of get a you bad classification, right? You right could, there. yeah. <clears throat> what happened now? Oh, that's so. Probably the wind. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. I didn't touch it. <laughs> yeah, so aspects that have, oh, sorry. Yeah, I was more wondering, like at some point, there seems to be, but if everybody does that, then it breaks down again. Is that how, how should I think about that? Anymore? I mean, breaks down again, not necessarily, right? I mean, what I'm saying is, like, if you all added a small dash to our profiles, yeah, then it's probably not gonna put all of us into, yeah, it's probably not gonna, favorites. yes, yes, there's like often the capacity constraint if you have a classification task or like an acceptance or something. It's not gonna work at the surface. I agree. We haven't considered that. And in your in your original model, would that show up if I retrained, or is it just not modeled? Um, I assume it's not really modeled because you allow people to manipulate. So, so alpha one would mean that you just take your distribution of choice, and you will get the model that you can name the distribution. Um, I think that yeah, it's. That the model would like allow for it, but you would need to make that probably an assumption on the learner that it has sort of some constraints, number of people they accept or something. It would no longer just pick up on the signal. It would not no longer, it would not be possible that everyone is sort of a subvention, right? something like that. But if the if all CVs are labeled software engineer, the learner would just 
predict that, right? Otherwise, we need to make an assumption on the derivative. I mean, I guess it, maybe a different way of saying this is like assume it's a ranking exercise. Yes. Then there is a cost to it as well because some people are now yes. getting lower ranked, and then oh, definitely there's a limit yes. to how much. Yes. Yes. You could say work in the mixture framework, but the results you know hold for that. But. Does uh, the psi play a role if you retrain this, or if you have uh, a setup with multiple, let's say, like strategy algorithm, strategy algorithm, in which now if everyone like put a dot in their CV, and the next time like the proportion of people, with the 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 thing is no longer so small that that strategy would work. So you need to do another strategy. Yeah, but, I mean. Yes, the next strategy will be evaluated on the data you start from, right? Yeah. So the uniqueness will change if the data has changed. Yes. Okay. You would probably want to pick something else. Or if you want to implement two strategies simultaneously, you need to have like no no wallet links in the sets. Yeah. So a couple of simplifications I made in that plot is, for example, that the, there's no heterogeneity in the population in terms of cost, which could be interesting. Um, for some people, it might be come with less cost to do adaptation because it doesn't mean a worse classification or because it's sort of uh, data plant is just closer to what they start from. There could be a heterogeneity in the effect size um, on the learner because the, some data points are more important than others just because they are in sort of support vector machines like the support vectors have more leverage over the model than any point that's far away. Um, you could take advantage of that heterogeneity by like targeted recruiting of participants in collectives, um, heterogeneous strategies where different people don't exactly implement the same thing so that in aggregate it works. Um, and then, yeah, mechanisms of organizing is the whole thing that I haven't, haven't touched upon. So, How do you imagine a future where like collective action, people like strategize and have like these algorithmic levers go into platforms? So for each platform app that makes the market, there's like a labor app that <laughs> coordinates labor. And we would hope that this gives rise to new equilibrium in the market that might lead to like better and more favorable labor outcomes and more competitive markets. To tie that back a bit more into what I talked about on Monday, is that we had this dynamics in prediction between society and the algorithmic predictions and like the, the platform. We've seen that platforms have power over like the population through prediction. We can like exert power and performative power was like a way to sort of quantify that. And collective action is more about how society can sort of impact the predictive systems. And you would hope this to sort of um, level off a bit more the power imbalance that's present in this system. So that's like the vision. And I have a few, yeah, just a few like interesting future works that I haven't touched upon. So we just proposed this, this model. It's like a population level model. So we haven't talked about finite sample considerations. There could be like interesting connections to um, the signal to noise ratio in the data. So if you want to plant the signal, you need to sort of overcome the noise so the model picks up on it. Um, there, there is like some interesting work in a different context on how models are more sensitive to collective action if they um, have a higher memorization capacity. So the more they memorize, the more you can do with like individual data points. So there might be interesting connection there. Um, you could think about other strategies, other goals, more complex utility functions, um, even settings beyond labor. Um, there's been a lot of like strategies also documented on, say, Twitter or on YouTube. There was sort of a bug in the YouTube algorithm that sort of videos with like calls got promoted very high, and then YouTubers agreed to just excessively use that feature. So it's going to be like not so influential anymore for YouTube's algorithm. There are like a lot of um, really a lot of interesting examples in practice. Um, we looked at text data. You can look at vision speed, tabular data. I think there are interesting phenomena there as well. Um, incentive design, connections to mechanism design, what, what Max mentioned earlier. How do collectives form? Can we like look at existing strategies, model them within our framework? Um, 
Relationships to power, I think there's something interesting to be made more formal here. Uh, how can we use information advantage of collectives? So certain strategies have assumed that you know P0. The gradient strategy assumed that you know P0 because you need to cancel the gradient on the base distribution. This is something that I argue with collectives becomes more reasonable to assume than if you have an individual because you can pool information and you can try to sort of approximate these distributions. So you have at least more of a fighting chance to sort of know it compared to individual strategies. Um, yeah, I mentioned mechanisms for organizing, maybe potential negative results and lower bounds. Um, one thing I wanted to mention that I haven't mentioned yet is that I think there are like, there's another interesting connection to like more these strategic settings that we talked about earlier in the week where it's more like a reverse order of play. Population goes first and the uh, algorithm responds. Mm -hmm. So it's more like, as we mentioned before, instead of like the firm optimizing through the response of the population, the population optimizes through the response of them. Um, yeah, I think that's all, uh, all I have. Um, do you have any like thoughts, questions, or challenges? So just on the on the organizing point, I mean, I guess one thing is for the for the manipulating X strategy. Yes. The a challenge is that basically the people you have to have bought in are the people who are already classified as the target Y star, right? So, for example, like if you want to get more people classified as software engineers, you need the people you need to manipulate their X's are the software engineers. So you sort of you can't get people in some sense you can't get people from outside the category classified into it without the help of the people in the category that's a good point so if you cannot manipulate the label that's true. so if you can yeah. manipulate the label if you feature label strategy you don't rely on that yeah but yeah that's a good point um i mean not that that yes. is in any way a fatal flaw but just thinking about that's, if you yeah, were to take point. it to a yeah or econ thing yes yes you need that Um, so in the literature of strategic learning, the agents can manipulate their features to, for gaming, right? Can we understand this work as some kind of collaborative gaming, where they co-organize something together to game the system? Um, yeah, I don't like to think of it as like gaming, or that's that's like the traditional way of thinking about like ad all adversaries, like strategic classification. I more think of it as like. A utility maximizing, yeah. So it's not necessarily adversarial, ad, adversarial, right? You could like pursue a different strategy that could be like more aligned with the with the utility. And I think one thing that's like very different is that you have like this collective aspect here in strategic classification. You often have sort of the individual utilities um, that you look at. I think these are sort of the main differences. But it definitely bears like similarities in that level. We take actions in response to or interacting with a particular. But I really think it's interesting. It's it's a very different perspective, at least maybe not so much for econ people, but in machine learning, a lot of things are very institution-centric. The way we write down problems, it's always the learner. The learner has like the undisputable right objective they try to solve. And then there are people that are like adversarial and trying to sort of fully it or manipulate it. That's sort of like a very common way of thinking about problems. And then you try to protect against these things. That's that's the, the setting that's like studied predominantly. I mean, so it's kind of similar in a lot of economic mechanism design in particular, right? Very yeah. principal agent problem, but implicitly you're kind of thinking inside the principle. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's the state, so often it's like a private employer or something. Yeah, yeah, then that's that's similar. Yeah. yeah, so I think it's, it's healthy to have like different perspectives. Any other suggestions? So most of the results we presented here, they have like a flavor of this first best, but in practice in economics, we have like foundation results of you know, you know, incentive compatible with the rational value balance mechanism exists. Mm -hmm. So we usually set up for first and best. Approximations. Uh, I don't know if you have any uh, ideas on how and uh, like how how much would that uh, displace in the alpha levels? I we haven't looked into that. We just looked at like concrete strategies that we were interested in. So we, we started from the strategy and then 
or to it a study wrong. So you said the existence of a strategy, right? So I think I think the point here, I mean, I think it's precisely on the on the gold part section that, that you mentioned, which is uh, what do we need for that strategy to be in sense stable or for people okay. to actually come into that yeah. strategy? And what we need is a series of requirements like incentive compatibility for individual regression outcome. And uh, I think actually those kind of purposes end up being like very uh, the then puts higher constraints on which kind of uh, actions on what purposes we, we, we can get. So I understand that in this context that will imply displacing the, the, the alpha level, but the, the alpha like to be under supply in this context medium, sending to the, to the right of, of the graph and, and potentially needing much larger. Uh, so you think you're I, oh, sorry. Um, just maybe trying to translate it. Is it your thing? Collective action that's implementable in the sense of is that compatible yeah, exactly. with risk. Yeah. yeah, I think it's, it's a constrained version of what you're doing here. That's yeah. that's a, that's a great point, but I don't see think of it as like shifting alpha. I think alpha is the thing that you would need to get your goal, but then it's a problem of how you recruit these alpha people. Exactly. Yeah. That's so exactly what it means. But okay. Yeah. Some of your like empirics, they, you kind of show that we are actually very small. Uh, a very small city will actually do the trip. Yes. My concern is once we factor in this uh, collective deviations or this uh, strategy preference, whatever, perhaps those numbers scale up very quickly. I don't know if you had like a sense of how fast they could scale. I don't. I don't have a sense. Um, but I'm also not like too familiar. So this will mean that. Do you also do you see a problem, for example, in that like CV setting that people would not be sort of willing to do it? Yeah, it's like probably not this year. The cost is like so limited uh, unless we have like some constraints on us uh, changing the change of the labels. Mm -hmm. But in most uh, applications, I would understand that there is some implicit cost on especially being an early adopter. Yes, that's and, true. Uh, in fact, that could uh, largely prevent. Uh, uh, the, the adoption overall and consequently much higher levels of alpha in the population would be needed to, to reach that threshold. No, that's, I mean, that's super interesting. So what we show here is that from a learning perspective, there's hope that you can achieve a lot with like a small collective. Um, these questions, I don't have a good answer for. I'm like very curious to sort of also myself like work on it a bit more and learn about that. I think these are like all great questions, but yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I mean, just, just maybe following up on this, um, I, I would think intuitively that a lot of this, um, like questions about being on center from the beginning to this week, it is hugely relevant as soon as you also say, you know, these in the population, these different alpha people, maybe there is some like, asymmetric information. So the things you mentioned, maybe they don't know how much it would cost the other person to ship their data. And then all of these things are hugely relevant. But if you just think about this, say, plain case where, among all these several people, they know exactly how much it would cost the other to change their data. Um, like to me, I feel like the, lang the language, it, might, is, it sounds to me like classic application of this coalitional game theory, where you ask yourself which coalitions of these several people could form. Do you have kind of, you know, individually rational um, payoffs when certain people form a coalition and you say it's staying Yeah, it's a, so it's a little bit different. I mean, that's like, a, it's, a, it's a great link to sort of is uh, to like game theory and how the coalitions form. So we more have like, we don't compete um, group groups. There's no like competition between groups here. It's just like the people and the platform. Yeah. It's, a, it's I think the setting is a little bit different. I remember I looked into it in like detail and I thought there are like very interesting connections, but it doesn't quite map because like, yeah, I don't remember the exact reasons, but I, yeah, we spent a lot of time looking into it. But there was like some important thing of like the competition between collisions. And if you just have one collision, one grand collision, things kind of collapse in terms of the results. Cool. Yeah, any other like thought or like direction I should look into? Well, thank you very much. <laughs>